Welcome to The Metal Prognosis, my name is Lee, and on this video we're going to be talking about reamping guitars. So I'm going to show you the full setup on how to do it in, a, um, in Cubase, and then we're going to muck around a little bit on different ways and how we can utilise it in different options. Just have some fun. So, cue the cute little cartoon intro, let's start setting stuff up, and yeah, start having some fun. All right, now I've got everything set up and ready to go. Uh, I've got my session here. So what we have here is a few dry guitar recordings. So if you have a look, I've done all the tracking and done all the little splicing and uh, punch-ins that I need to make it sound, you know, really, really nice. And if I just turn these off, this is what the guitars sound like uh, at the moment. So, from an engineering perspective, that's awesome. That's nice, clean, and exactly what you want. But what we're really are aiming to do is take that performance and take it out into something else and then bring it back in so it sounds spectacular. So just to show you a little bit of under the hood as well, I didn't record it like that. Uh, I recorded it using uh, the Fortin uh, NTS or Neural DSP, and they sound like this. So a lot more brutal, a lot heavier, so I could really capture the characteristics and the essence that I wanted uh, out of my guitar playing. So if you saw my other video on um, how I approach recording guitar with uh, all my little tricks on how I get this, the very first thing I did was track it using a, a DI box. So going in there is nice and clean, and um, well, as you heard, they, they are pretty, pretty solid um, quality in those. Then what I've got is on my Steinberg, uh, what is it, a UR44C. It has, I think, four ins and four outs. I say four ins, four outs. It's four ins um, and two lots of outs, a left and a right and a second left and a right. So what I've done is I've just named this one dry because my second lot of in and outs, um, we're going to be sending the dry signal out of there, nothing else, uh, so we know. Um, ba -ba -ba. So what we need to do is get this all rocking. So we'll take, it's a little bit tricky with the left-right aspect, so because I've got it coming out of the left, I've got to shoot the other one out left as well, otherwise you get this weird little buzz uh, coming through, which is really, really painful. And I can't explain why it does that, but it's, it's done that on every setup I've, done, I've ever used. So what we're going to do is we're going to uh, solo uh, these two. So this is going to be the playback. And because we're playing it back, we don't want it going through the bus of the guitar anymore. We want it to go through dry. So it's going through dry, panned hard left. Because if we have it just panning as a stereo thing, some right's going to slip through. And that's where the unwanted buzz is going to really burn your ears and not in a good way. So I've got it going out of there. I have my... Passive uh, reamping DI box, which is a lot like my uh, direct DI box, but the thing I love about this one is it has a phase inverter if I want to change the phase, and it has a mute button, a ground, and it has its own level in there. So if I feel like not enough is quite coming out, I'll push it a bit harder to try equal as it would if I was actually um, having the real guitar being plugged in. So that is going straight out into my angle amp back there and I have a mic on my cab uh, down there so we can hear it. Then after that we'll shake it up a different way and see how it all goes. So if I just play it here for example, ah we're getting nothing. Okay let's see. Ah because dry is not done. <laughs> okay now it's coming through. So for some reason um, not some reason, the reason I didn't push the button, uh, the dry channel, because I like to have everything soloed when I'm reamping and doing it, so then uh, there are no other interferences or anything cutting through, even though you can set it up so you can have everything playing as, as with it, I like to just know. And I'll go into more detail in a minute or why other reasons I like to do that too. So.
So there it is. It's going out of the computer into my uh, angle amp and in my cabinet in the room here. And it is uh, decently volumed. So if we were going to do um, the right one now, we would mute that. And we've got to send it to dry. And we're getting nothing, which is good, better than the squeals. Uh, so we pan that all left. In theory. Why don't you work it? Ah, oh, because dry solo again. And now we just have the right tape going in. All right, so now moving on on cool stuff we can do with that. Um, so that's awesome. But now, what I might want to do is go, all right, hypothetically, let's say, not quite there yet. We haven't quite nailed it. So we want to add something else to it to help the chain. So we still want to use a real amp. So I'll unplug this and we'll chuck it through a Fortin 33. <laughs> uh, oh, it's going to make noise. I don't... <laughs> the laziness of me not wanting to reach back and to <laughs> turn the standby button on. And saying that, um, I need to get up anyway. I'm one cable short now. Bear with me. So now if I play it, and then I'll engage the pedal in and out, and we can have a listen to that and see how that goes. And so forth, we can go through the whole thing. And uh, for example, if we just push record now, have our take right there. So that's our final take with the cab all captured and looking at the wave files now it's like well it's loud in the room but I can push it a, a lot more to get it more um, of a comfortable and healthier uh, sound wave going through there. But that's a little bit fun of there. So that was with the cab. That was cool. That turned out great. But let's try a different method. So I'll undo that. So then when I start unplugging stuff, you're not going to hear the clicks and the clank. So I'll turn the amp off now because we don't need it. And let's bring in, let's bring in an old trusty that I thought would be fun. Let's say we wanted to use a pod uh, 2.0 for this because who doesn't love the pod 2.0? So bear with me while I just plug it all in. All right, now I've got the pod 2.0 set up and I'll fix up the other camera just so it's a little bit better for us. Uh, let's check it out. I've also got it running through the 33 too, just because it's fun. So we play that. So, oh, that's noisy. Cool. It's just 23 years old, that piece of equipment. So let's add the 33 to it now. Um, see if I can tilt it a bit like that so the camera can pick it up. Maybe not. I'm guessing. Ah, it's not going to want to play the game anyway. No. That's what we're going with. 
I'll just go here. Once again, if you wanted to capture that. And you got your final take there. That's awesome. And what I tend to do is uh, then I'll take this and move it to exactly where I'll have it locked on uh, grid so it wouldn't move like as much so I can make sure it stays in time with itself and I'd have these channels set up here for like the final takes of what I would do and just move it from there to the final take make sure it's on um, zero 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 so it hasn't moved it before or afterwards and that would be my final take but I'll do that as the whole track not just little sections because uh, yeah the work's already done so that's cool so you can get the pod 2 going with different pedals and that as well so let's just try one more little one for shits and giggles because it's heaps of fun. So bear with me, I'll set up something else again and we'll check it out as well. All right, so now I've got the next one set up, but the thing with this one is it is a preamp. So firstly, we had the cab mic'd up, which is really cool. The other one uh, with the Pod 2.0 that had its own equivalent of a, an IR setup with its, I think it's called Air uh, something. Uh, so that had a cab simulator on it. This one does not. So if we play it now. Sounds a bit fuzzy because it's got no cab. And what we do is, uh, oh, here's, here's one I prepared earlier. Uh, we add the cab in there. We get a really, really cool sound just like that. If we want to record that, record it. And there you got your track there. Uh, all ready to rock and roll just with that. And that's a really cool thing I love about the chug pedal is it's a really, really powerful uh, preamp that you can use uh, for, for tracking like this. It comes, the quality is really good and solid. So there's one other thing you can do for reamping, which I'll run through now. Uh, so I'll just get rid of that. Is the easiest way to do it, which is kind of what we started with. So we go here, put it on guitar, and uh, turn that off. You go off. Let's undo that. Cool. Now I'm gonna make sure that old guitars are muted for my, for my scratch tracks. Is uh, this reamping by just adding this to it, and that's it. Solo, solo, solo. Ah, because I'm still setting it to dry. Go to guitars. So, now we go on to the more intricate parts of this all and why we do it and why the hell will we bother uh, going through all these different things just to be able to um, try to capture a sound we want in comparison to just getting the sound you want from the start and you know, off you go willy-nilly. The thing I love about this is, um, and I'll use this as an example with the Fortin um, NTS because it's on the screen and it's, yeah, 
convenience. And we all love the world of convenience, and I've got to stop trying to check the desk because the camera is on the desk. So firstly is the actual performance. Because, uh, well I did this myself, but if I was working with another guitarist, uh, investing the time, guitars, bass, uh, in with vocals I like to do it as well, because you might want to uh, send the vocals out to a different preamp and back in, which is the same as reamping, the same theory. You're getting a signal that's pre-recorded, sending it out of your studio, and then looping it back in. Um, it, same with drums even, where uh, with the kick drum you might want to give it a different type of gate and compression with some external equipment later on. Uh, all for the same theory of if you capture it well enough to start with, then you can spend hours, hours, as long as you feel is necessary, I don't want to put an exact time on it for you, to try capture the conclusion and the right results that you actually want. So with the guitar tones, um, because I've captured the performance, or I've had another mu musician come and capture the performance, they can go away. If they just home in on what they're playing and how they're playing it, rather than what results are popping through for them um, with whatever equipment they're, they're helping create their speech for, uh, to give their, their instrument a voice, um, then we can do this. We can go through, reamp it through, for example, my angle amp with an actual cab with different microphones, and we can test different microphones. We can chuck it through something like the Chug pedal pod 2.0, if you're super, super adventurous. Um, try different pedals with different amp heads. Use different, um, like I didn't use my um, two notes uh, for this video, but that's a very popular one that I love it too, having a hybrid setup where I've got an amp going straight into my two notes there, and then using um, a, a cab uh, like uh, the NAD IR cabinet simulator. I had a lot of trouble getting that out for some reason. Uh, <laughs> stuttering is a bizarre thing, which is a really cool way of doing it as well. So it gives us those options to be adventurous, to try without forcing the musician to keep going backwards and forwards. They've captured their magic, they've got it. Um, so then we can worry about the engineer side of it, can try and capture the, the, uh, the final polish of what we want in the actual mix. Because the last thing we'd want to do, because the alternative is, if you're not quite sure, you're going to have to get the muso in, and you're going to have to try every single one of them if you want to. No, you have to try every single one, but whatever is on your short list to give them a shot to see which one's going to feel and gel the best with you, and you might not know. You might get different boost pedals, different distortion pedals, different um, compression units and things that can do stuff that you might be super keen to try, or different amp heads and different speakers, and the, it's, it's endless of different possibilities that could pop up on how you'd want to approach it. So reamping for me is uh, probably one of my favorite things in regards to this whole process of doing it because it does give you that leeway to be able to be creative um, at the tail end of this whole process and not just get um, uh, overly committed and then extremely limited. Which you've seen in some of my other videos, I do love the limitations and seeing where I can take it and what I can do with it. Uh, but in a perfect world or a more prime setup on how we do things, this is uh, in my my opinions and my experience, one of the most solids and strongest way to do it. And also keep in mind, if you do do it this way, I'm just talking about in my little tiny studio that I've got here. I have friends um, all over the world. I could send them these dry files and go, there you go. And they can chuck it through their amps and their speakers and their little setups and they can try it or whatever they want in their studio with their stuff, which I don't have. Um, the physical accessibility to. The digital one I do, absolutely. Uh, so we can utilize things that way uh, as well, which is brilliant. So there we have it. Um, a quick rundown on reamping and some of the really cool stuff you can do with it to get some really rad results. Um, yeah, so I think there was, what, five different ways we could do it, which was, let's go in, in, in order of history. 
So running it out of your um, of your mixer through an analog amp and cabinet and remiking it up in there. So that was the you know the OG way of doing it. Then the next way after that would have been um, the pod 2.0 uh, or the pod any any of the pods really. Those ones are popped out to so reamp via those, which for in a studio it's great because you can have it in the control room because there's no speakers involved in it. It emulates it in the unit, so it's all closed connections and you can just set your own volume. It's great. Um, so going from that, then the other one would be, I would say, um, the VSTs. So like uh, the Neural DSP, and that could be, um, you know, any of the uh, Audio Assault ones and, and the plenty of other companies that do um, really, really cool uh, amp amp and speaker and, and pedal simulators uh, and that. So, yeah, real on analog amps, the little pod 2.0 type of setups. Um, the VST things came next. Then it would be, I would reckon, probably just a straight preamp pedals because you had preamp pedals that you'd put through amp uh, effects loops. Um, so it'd be the preamp ones, you know, to um, capture them that way, and then using the uh, different IR um, emulators on the computer to be able to capture it. And the last one would be uh, the two notes, uh, the torpedo two notes, are some type of um, uh, capture the load box like that, where you could chuck your amp straight in there and then have a speaker simulator in the computer. So yeah, there we go. Thank you very much for joining me and this little, um, not only just talk through, but ramble as well. Appreciate you putting up with my stutter if you've lasted this long, because it was a little bit popped up, a little bit niggly here and there and all that. And I thoroughly look forward to uh, chatting with you next time. So please, share your comments and your thoughts whenever you had them. And stay safe.